Now at five, a nine hour standoff with police puts one suspect in the hospital. The latest on the shooting with officers in Corbett and later. Protesters mark the one year anniversary of the death of Breonna Taylor. The continued calls for justice as the president vows for police reform. But first, demonstrations here in Portland again turn destructive. Police corral protesters in the Pearl District, including journalists. What we know about this crowd control tactic. This is KGW News at 5. You had uh, about 100 people uh, trapped in a, a city block. Portland's protests met with a shift in strategy. Police last night corralled a big crowd into a small space downtown where they took names and photos. It's called kettling. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Brittany Falkers. Now, this tactic has been challenged in court before, and Portland's mayor has said he's not always comfortable with it. The city leaders are blunt. They don't want the protests to spiral out of control again. Here's Maggie Vespa. I'm not doing anything. Portland police turning the page in their playbook after protests flared up again this week. Friday night, officers corralled close to 100 people near Northwest 13th and Marshall. They took photos, names, and as one video shows, forced journalists out of the perimeter. I'm a member of the press. I, we already asked the press to leave. Police declined to comment on that video, but said they are reviewing the Bureau's response as a whole, adding PPB respects the rights of members of the press. Suzette Smith, a freelance journalist who often works for the Portland Mercury, snapped this photo of an officer photographing her. They demanded my full name and my birth date, which they wrote on a piece of duct tape and then gave it to me to put on my chest. I was advised that if I returned to the protest, they would arrest me. You are all being detained for the investigation of a crime. Police kept the crowd there for hours, saying they were investigating a crime, later saying that crime was destruction of property. This after people smashed windows and set fires Thursday night in businesses and government buildings alike. People telling reporters they're protesting everything from federal immigration policy to police shootings. This is so illegal. The tactic of detaining crowds this size is known as kettling. PPB used it years ago, prompting two lawsuits from civil rights advocates. Both stalled or were tossed out earlier this year, according to the Oregonian. Portland's mayor told the paper then he wouldn't ban the tactic, but added it has to be well planned and well trained for. Saturday, his office said the bureau had since undergone extensive training, but Mayor Wheeler stopped short of condoning kettling. His office adding tactical decisions are made by the incident commander. The ongoing criminal vandalism must stop. It holds small businesses hostage. In his State of the City address Friday, he, the chief of police and other local leaders, addressed the protests in general. So the George Floyd killing and the things associated with that, I feel have just been kind of put off to the side. Uh, because they've been, again, hijacked. Saturday, police released photos of weapons and tactical gear, which they say were left behind in the kettle perimeter. 13 people were arrested. Charges include possession of a loaded firearm in public, attempted assault of a public safety officer, and in the case of one juvenile, felony criminal mischief for breaking a window. Maggie Vespa, KGW News. Now, this afternoon, the ACLU of Oregon, along with other civil rights groups, put out a statement condemning the kettling tactic. They described it as unconstitutional and say they're calling for a federal investigation. Developing tonight, police say a man is in the hospital with critical injuries following a standoff and shootout with officers overnight. Police say it started at about nine last night in Corbett near the historic Columbia River Highway. A Multnomah County Sheriff's deputy says they saw a car speeding and driving erratically. When they pulled the car over, the driver stepped out with guns drawn. A nine hour long standoff then started. Police say it ended early this morning with an exchange of gunfire. A Multnomah County deputy and a Gresham police officer both fired their guns. They are on administrative leave during the investigation. No officers were hurt. The suspect is a white man in his 60s. Police say they expect to release more information early next week. 
Well, the first people are expected to start receiving stimulus payments this weekend. Earlier this week, President Biden signed the American Rescue Plan, which includes those $1,400 checks. Those with direct deposits set up are expected to see the money first. The IRS has launched its Get My Payment tool, so you can track your check. Just visit irs.gov for more information on that. Anticipation over those stimulus payments and vaccine appointments is also creating opportunity for scammers. Yeah, you may have gotten some texts like this one. They are annoying, yes, but for people expecting a text telling them when they qualify for the vaccine or that they have money coming their way, these phishing scams are sadly more effective than ever. Catherine Cook talked with an expert about how you can protect yourself. Let's start with a troubling statistic. Experts say the number of scam text messages sent has risen 300% since last summer. The unfortunate reason? People are clicking on those text links, whether they're about stimulus money, the vaccine, or something else entirely. It might say, did you get all of your stimulus money? Find out by clicking on this link. Or learn more about your stimulus benefits here. Attackers get into your life. Carrie Tomlinson is editor in chief with Archer News Network, a cybersecurity news organization. She says cyber crooks are playing on doubts and questions surrounding these critical topics. The texts often mention the recipient's state to make them seem more legit. Here's one I got suggesting I had Oregon unemployment benefits that I needed to act on. Other messages will bait you with keywords like COVID, stimulus, or vaccine, hoping you'll click on the link. And we'll go, okay, that looks right. I'll go there. But it will be a fake site. They'll collect your information and they'll either either they'll either directly use that information right now to take your money, or they'll sell it to someone else who can use it later to take your money. The Department of Justice recently warned of a huge increase in fake websites designed to look like bank or government pages. So what to do if you get a scam text? First, recognize it. Be wary of any unsolicited text message from a number you don't know that contains a link. Some, but not all, may have misspelled words or poor grammar. So you need to just avoid clicking on the link. Also, don't reply to the text. Just delete it. You can forward the message to 7726, which spells out spam. That flags carriers there is a problem. Besides text messages, scammers are still sending phishing scams via email. Same rules apply there. Don't click on any links. In some cases, doing so could download malware onto your device. When in doubt, do your own research about what the message is saying. And remember, I may not get all the answers right away, but I sure as heck will not get any answers by clicking on the link in this FACO message that I've been sent. Catherine Cook, KGW News. Good advice there. Well, despite President Biden's calls for all Americans to be eligible for a COVID vaccine by May 1st, Oregon Governor Kate Brown is not changing the state's timeline for now. She says it'll come down to having enough vaccine doses available. Right now, Oregon is currently getting about 126,000 doses a week. State health officials estimate that number would have to jump to three or 400,000 a week in April to meet the president's goal. If the doses are there, I have every intention of utilizing all available state and federal resources to match the president's timeline for universal eligibility. An earlier state survey also predicted Oregon could not handle more than about 300,000 doses a week. So it's questionable if Oregon could pull off the president's timeline, even if it got the biggest supply possible. Right now, all Oregon adults are not set to be vaccine eligible until July 1st. A massive telescope is missing tonight. The owners say thieves not only took the special equipment, but also opportunity away from kids in rural Oregon. Galen Etland and photojournalist Stephen Redland share how this theft is fueling a movement. Forrest Babcock knows his telescopes. The light comes in, bounces off the main mirror up to a secondary. He lives in Carleton, a small town in Yamhill County. His crown jewel is this 15-foot, 800-pound blue telescope. I worked on that telescope for 48 years. But Thursday, his decades of hard work were taken 
A trailer holding the telescope and several others was stolen in rural Washington County. They started to shake. His wife, Janet Zelke, says someone used bolt cutters to detach the trailer, likely not knowing what was inside. They probably opened it up and said some choice words like, what in the heck is that? Before COVID, the couple took that telescope on the road to wineries, empty lots, schools, giving people a window to worlds beyond. And then when they put their eyeballs on that lens and see, say, the rings of Saturn for the first time, it's like magic. From revealing detailed craters on the moon to swirls on Jupiter, this is no ordinary telescope. When the kids come out and they look to the telescope, they get inspired. For this small community, it's an enormous deal. Lynette Shaw is a neighbor who says events around the telescope provide valuable education for students in rural and underfunded districts. To lose that would be an enormous loss for the community. That community is fired up, sharing Janet's plea for help on social media hundreds of times over. This is the design for the new Carleton Observatory. The telescope is the centerpiece of a bigger dream, a science center focused on astronomy. And this is just starting to get traction. The Carleton Observatory paused fundraising during COVID, but this latest blow isn't about the money. I don't know how you put worth on thousands of hours of work in that blue telescope. This is the mirror. The saving grace is the telescope's key lens was not inside the trailer, instead stored safely at home. Together, the equipment is worth about $15,000. This is the aperture for the big telescope that was stolen. But without this 100-pound mirror, the big telescope isn't much use. They hope the thieves realize that and do the right thing. Drop it off anywhere you want. Uh, we just want the telescope back. We don't even care about the trailer. No questions asked. Just bring it back to us. So that future generations can keep feeling inspired by the heavens. Galen Etlin. KGW News.